Hello everyone, welcome to our talk on composites in FRC. My name is Lara and I was the subsystem lead for Arm Links in 2023 and the subsystem lead for the Climber in 2022. Uh, and I'm Mac, I'm the current manufacturing lead. Okay, so we're gonna start off by talking about what is a composite. So a composite is basically a mix of two different materials in order to create something like kind of specialized and strong. Uh, it's different from like an alloy. An alloy is kind of like you take two different materials to create a new material, uh, while a composite is like two different materials and you're having them like shake hands, but not actually like becoming one thing. Um, so uh, composites have like certain advantages. Uh, for instance, you can like, I guess like get certain properties out of them that you wouldn't be able to get otherwise. So like you can get something that's like super strong and also like light at the same time with like a composite. So for some examples of composites, you have carbon fiber and fiberglass. There's also glass and carbon fiber reinforced nylon, continuous fiber 3D prints, Reinforced concrete, like the ground, um, that, that's something you see in everyday applications. You also will see like plywood, that's another common composite. So some examples of composites in our 971 robots, starting off with this past season. In 2023, we designed a double jointed carbon fiber arm. Uh, so for this, we were using carbon fiber tubes and um, you see them here and here, these are carbon fiber tubes, and that's what's most obvious on the 2023 robot. But there's also a lot of composites used in the 3D prints. So the 3D prints on the end effector, on the spacers, on the mounts, the cameras, that, those are all also composites. Uh, in 2022, we have our robot here, which is a carbon fiber catapult on a turret. And uh, the turret is important because it has this cable that wraps around. And there's another composite, plywood. There was two questions I got when I was on pit crew um, on this robot. They were like, whoa, carbon fiber catapult. Second question is like, is that wood on your robot? Top two questions. The wood is also another composite. And uh, you don't want to overlook using things like wood on your robot because for different use cases, those, those, that can be an, an optimal material. Um, also on this robot, you have the same 3D printed parts, especially on your cameras. Um, that's something we often use the 3D printed parts for, as well as spacers, and we'll get more into that. Following, this is the 2019 robot. One of our design goals in 2019 was to have a light and maneuverable robot. So we wanted it to be small frame perimeter, have light, and be able to travel really fast. We also didn't want it to be super top heavy, especially in something where you need to reach high up. You want to be mindful of your weight uh, so you don't tip over during matches. So for this, um, we wanted to have a carbon fiber elevator so it is lighter and it still has this, that same stiffness. Uh, in 2018, very similarly to like uh, 2023, we had carbon fiber tubes on the arms so that, you know, it would be lighter but also, you know, just as strong. Uh, and in 2015, uh, we didn't use carbon fiber as much as some other years, but we used it for this kind of tray down here so that, you know, but the... We, we wanted to do that because for carbon fiber, you can mold it into like certain shapes and have it still be like very, very strong. Uh, so we wanted it to be like a certain shape while still like retaining its like physical, like, you know, strength. That was a really dumb sentence, whatever. <laughs> You're all good. All right, so moving to uses of composites in FRC. So for mechanisms that need to be stiff and light, like elevators, arms, catapults, those are some use cases for that. There's also mechanisms that need to be strong and stiff with dimensional constraints. So things that um, like lifting forks, uh, if you wanna create unique um, shapes, that's something that Mac was talking about on the previous slide with your 2015 robot. This is a unique shape that would require a lot of bending of metal or like additive uh, manufacturing to get to. So we use the composited material there since we were able to mold it. So the, it will take an initial investment in a fixture in order to build it. So you're not only making the part, but you're also making the fixture for that part. Uh, but this allows you to create duplicate parts that are the exact same, and you can rely on um, time after time in order to create more. And then uh, 3D printed parts is one thing. This is continuous fiber 3D printed parts, and these can actually replace aluminum parts. 
And this is important because it will take the load off of traditional manufacturing methods. So we're going to shift to talking about carbon fiber tubes. Uh, for carbon fiber tubes, there's no um, prefab or no, there's layup necessary. So when you have a tube, you can buy those off the shelf and you don't have to uh, make your own layup for it. And you are able to customize and there's, because there are different orientations available to maximize strength for your application. So oftentimes, um, carbon fiber tubes can be used interchangeably with aluminum tubes. They're really simple to design with and you can have an easy backup plan of aluminum if necess necessary. So for FRC purposes in our team, uh, we, have, we like sourcing from Rock West Composites and then the tubes we've gotten are rolled wrap tubes and with standard modulus. And then for those of you in the back, you can take a seat up front if you'd like. You can move forward. All right. So for carbon fiber tubes, there's different load types. Um, you have your torsion and your bending. Um, those are the two things we were the most concerned about when we were designing uh, with these carbon fiber tubes in 2023. When you're looking at carbon fiber tubes, there's different fabric orientations. Uh, for torsion, uh, look for something that is like 45 degree fiber orientations. That will be stronger in torsion. And then for bending, you have zero and, to, and 90 degree fiber orientations. So this table here, um, you have the first ply. Your first ply is a zero degree orientation that is stronger in bending. And this table um, is from Rock West Composites and it goes from the inside to the outside. So this is from the inside structure of your tube moving outwards. Uh, your second ply is also 45, deg is 45 degrees. Third one is negative 45 degrees, so um, the orientation is backwards of that. So um, on this tube, we, there's like 11 different plies, which is like layers, and uh, five of them are 0 and 90, and six of them are 45 degree. And this allows us to have a balance between strength in torsion and bending. Uh, okay, so kind of like what Laura was saying earlier, uh, we the reason that we want to like pay attention to these different layers and like the angles they are is because they give us like certain advantages in certain like areas of the robot. So an example of this is our proximal and distal uh, for uh, this year's robot. So on the proximal, uh, it was kind of experiencing like twisting and like up and down forces on the arm. Uh, and so because of that, we wanted to implement 45 degree plies and 90 degree plies so that it would be able to kind of withstand the strain of both of those. Uh, while the distal, though, uh, it only needed the 90 degree ply because it was only facing like the up and down kind of forces upon it. So carbon fiber, I guess, yeah, the, in like deciding these different plies, it allows us to only get what we need from each like part of the arm. Okay, um, so when we're actually like manufacturing the tubes, so like usually we buy like the tubes online, right? Uh, and we, we've chosen the ply and stuff, but now we wanna implement it into our design. So there's ways you could do it, like you could drill holes into your tube, but that would kind of ruin a lot of the structural, like the structural integrity of the tube itself. So it's usually better to use like adhesives to bond your tube to like other parts of your robot. Um, so when you're like cutting the tube, like you're, you're given the tube, right? And you wanna like make it to the, like the right size so it fits your needs. Uh, you can use, there's a bunch of different tools you can do. We have a grinding wheel, a sander, and like a saw that you can use to cut it down to the size and, and have it be the way you want. It is like important to note though that when you are cutting carbon fiber, it, uh, the dust that comes out of it is very like dangerous. And if you like inhale any of that, it's a pretty big health risk. So you want to make sure that you're wearing the proper like safety protection or whatever, like the mask, like a N95 is something that you could use, but if you want to use like a, one of those like big painter masks, you can also use one of those as well. So just, yeah, keep safety in mind when, if you ever cut carbon fiber. Yeah, and this is a theme that will show up throughout our presentation. Um, this is the process that you do need to be mindful of what you're doing, how you're acting, and the people around you, um, and then ventilation is important. So now moving to bonding with two-part adhesives. Here in 971, we really love the 3M um, two-part adhesives. That's what we've used a lot. 
uh, we get easy and consistent results with the 3M applicator and nozzles. So this right here is the applicator and then on your epoxy, you'll add a different nozzle based on the, and the nozzle actually will mix your epoxy. Um, the, um, a lot of epoxies are, as it says, like two part adhesive. So in the nozzle, they'll actually mix together. And that's as soon as it goes to the nozzle, that's when your work time starts. So um, it can be used for non-composite cases as well. And it has better strength and it's easier than welding. Uh, we choose um, non sag adhesives that stay in um, place. That way we're reducing the amount of mess of like uh, adhesive like leaving the area that we want it to exist. So we'll have a quiz on this later. So remember part numbers. Uh, but if you do actually want to write down the different types of adhesive, feel free to take a photo at this point. But um, so for our larger um, carbon fiber pieces, you have um, 3M DP, for 6ONS. So that number is a specification if you're looking this up on a, um, just for the part number, but uh, more specifics of what this actually is, is it's um, used for, we use this for layups um, because it has a longer work time. Anything um, that takes more time, you, you have more time to work with it and there's less of a time pressure. Um, when there's so many steps and so many things that are part of it, uh, that time allows you to go through. Though what we do on our team, go ahead and take a photo. Uh, what we do on our team is we actually cut our work time in half, just so we have that safety margin. Um, so for the 60 minute work time, we're aiming to get everything done in within that 30 minutes. Um, same with our 10 minute one, which I'll talk about in a sec. So five minutes to get everything put together. Um, so this is an epoxy adhesive. It has uh, maximum strength but it actually requires really, really good surface prep. Um, you wanna make sure everything is clean in order to get that uh, proper bond. Um, in addition um, to like a metal composite, it's like a metal to a composite or a plastic to a composite uses. Uh, we've also used it for metal to metal and metal to plastic. Uh, our main focus here is using it with composites, but a lot of these adhesives can even be used with your typical aluminum to aluminum we do this on our drive base instead of welding. Um, our second one up here is 3MDP6310NS. Um, this one is what 3M actually recommends for adhesives in composite use. Um, the reason we use this only for our like pulleys was it has a really short work time. It has a work time of 10 minutes, um, but for our use case, it starts to get less workable the second half. So really that means you have five minutes to apply the epoxy and put everything in place. Um, this is, I'm um, sorry, I misspoke. This is actually an acrylic adhesive and it has stronger bonds even with like a suboptimal surface prep. This is also a non-sag. Yes. Do you have the part number for that applicator? Uh, I can get that to you okay. following the talk. Yeah, thanks. Question was part number for applicator. Sorry, I'm supposed to repeat questions. All right, so what layups and fixturing? Okay, so as Laura said before, you know, as soon as you start to apply the epoxy, you have a time period before it dries. So it's very important to be prepared before going into like your assembly uh, period. Uh, okay, so how do we do this? There's a bunch of ways that we can uh, prevent time losses during the actual process. Uh, first off, we could get all the parts laid out beforehand. So like we have these fixtures here, right? So I guess just like having those ready and then all the parts that you wanna combine, having those in front of you, uh, that's uh, a good place to start. Uh, clearing all surfaces. If you have like a cluttered workspace and you know, you're working and like stuff starts getting in the way, that's like, that's not good. You don't want that because now you're wasting time to kind of clean up your space. So just make sure your space is clean. Um, usually we work with like a team of people when putting it together. So uh, make sure that everyone knows what they're doing when the time comes to actually do it. Uh, if you just like start doing the epoxy stuff and then giving commands while it, like it's happening, people aren't gonna understand the first time. So it's, it's, like, it's a good idea to just make sure everyone's on the same page. Also uh, assigning tasks so you don't have to like assign them when you're working, right? Uh, like for when we were making the carbon fiber arm this year, we'd have someone hold the tube and like spin it around while someone else took the epoxy and applied it. Uh, so just like, yeah, making sure everyone knows what they're doing. 
Uh, also, service prep all parts in advance. Uh, all parts need to be service prepped before they get put together or you know, your arm isn't gonna be as strong. So make sure that that is all done beforehand because that's not something that needs to be done seconds before you actually do this stuff. So like anything that you can do before, you should do before. Yeah, and in terms of preparation, a big part of this is having a checklist. You wanna make sure that you are hitting every single step. And something I'd like to reference with checklist is you should be able to hand this checklist to someone and they can tell you if you're going through. Your checklist doesn't have the exact directions for every step, but um, what are the important parts that um, this thing will fall apart if you miss something? So if we don't remember the surface prep, your bond's not gonna be as strong. If we're not turning it, we're gonna have epoxy getting everywhere. Um, so those are your specific tasks um, that you can um, outline in your checklist. Uh, this also allows you to get new students in. They don't have to have prior experience because everything's detailed out. On our um, like making of these um, arms that you see on our like robots, we had new members building those carbon fiber arms. We had electrical students at times. We had mechanical students who have years of experience. There was a wide variety of people working on this because when you outline and you break into steps, anyone can be involved in that process. And that's something we'd like to do here at 971. Um, you're involved in every step. You can work on CAD as a freshman. You can work on building the like, arm as a freshman. You can be part of all these steps, even if you're new to the team, and there'll be experienced students to guide you. So as a lead, I was making sure this was communicated. Mac here was also um, a core part in making sure we got through all the layups um, according to our checklists. So going into the very detailed list of surface prep, um, surface prep is really important, uh, especially when working with epoxies to ensure that you get a um, solid bond. So we started with our aluminum parts and we used Scotch-Brite. Um, we did use sandpaper at the start of the process, but um, by our later iterations, we were using Scotch-Brite for a better surface prep. And one thing here is, you don't get told this often in robotics, but be chaotic. Please, we love the chaos in um, this element. You want to be non-uniform with your um, like scotch brighting. You want to rough up the surface, but don't have it be like a uniform um, like roughed up. So make sure it's going all directions. It's very like scuffed up. Uh, following that, you're going to take um, a napkin uh, with isopropyl alcohol and like wipe down um, your parts. This is your first step in terms of like using chemicals. Again, be careful with what you're using. Um, as most things in the robotics lab, they're not the safest to consume. So make sure that you are like not touching your face or things like that. You're working with gloves with all these chemicals. This gets especially important when we move to acetone. So this is where we switch gloves. Um, so we're gonna clean with acetone. And once you have cleaned off your part with acetone, this is when it becomes do not touch. This is when you've finished your surface prep process. Um, that part at this point needs to be set aside. Um, you don't want to be touching that part as soon as if someone touches it. If someone like, walks in and is like, ooh, cool part, touches it, you have to start again. Um, and that's why you need to be really like, um, good at communicating uh, and placing items. We had our table actually taped into sections of which parts were done, which parts were not done. We had different areas that we were placing things into. So it was well communicated on what parts can we touch, what parts can we use, um, versus which ones are finished with the uh, surface prep process. So once you go through your aluminum parts, that's when we move to our carbon fiber parts. Uh, we want to mark places of contact, and this is the only area that you're sanding. Uh, you only want to, uh, you want to sand the least amount of carbon fiber as possible because that carbon fiber dust is toxic for inhalation. Again, wearing masks, for us when we did this process, it was required, we had, it was, uh, we had a mandate in our lab to wear masks at all times because of COVID, but this is something you need to be mindful. Um, good ventilation um, and also wearing masks in this process. Um, we wet actually our scotch bright with isopropyl alcohol to keep the dust sticking to the scotch bright. We made sure to get rid of everything in a sealed fashion so that there wasn't carbon fiber dust um, just in our air. Um, you're gonna isopropyl or sandpaper it um, repeated times until you get a scuffed up finish. You should be able to wipe it off and see a difference between the smooth finish of the carbon fiber tube and the section that you have now sandpapered or scotch breaded. 
and then you'll repeat these two steps until you get through and until you have a like a matte finish. Uh, from then you're going to switch your gloves and then wipe down with acetone as well. Um, when you're going through this, you also want to mask off any area that you don't want epoxy. This is really important, especially if you have bearings. As most of you probably know, bearings are need a very specific fit. So any bearing surfaces, if you get a little bit of epoxy, your bearings no longer going to fit on that. Um, and then that is, that's one thing that we made sure to tape off. You also want to add tape so you get clean lines when you are epoxying. Also, acetone is something you need to be really careful with. If you get acetone on 3D printed parts, it is possible that you melt the part. So being mindful of like chemicals and um, using them. So on our 3D printed parts, I believe we just use um, isopropyl alcohol just to clean it off, um, make sure all your parts were clean there. So the next step is fixturing. So these right here are our fixtures for this past season's robot. Uh, this reason for fixturing is to keep all arms consistent and hold like your components in place. So this is the 80-20 structure, that's the base of our fixture, and it is actually designed with even zip ties on these molds. This was something that was um, done on purpose because you want to be able to hold everything in place and have it stay that way throughout the entire curing process. Consistency is important. Um, like in this picture, we have a one, two, three block here. That way we knew it was completely flush against the end of our fixture. It was into the part the same on every single arm. Because um, imagine if you are trying to reach something and place a cone and one arm is like a solid six inches longer. Of course, it's not going to be that dramatic, but say something happens. You don't have a fixture, you have no way to set it. So one arm can reach it from um, so far away. One arm, you have to go a lot closer. If you ever are in a competition, if you switch arms, that makes it a whole lot harder. So especially our software team is, wants us to have the arms as like, um, similar as possible to make that switch like, super smooth. OK, um, so mold prep is very similar to the part prep for uh, like all the stuff that goes in. Uh, the molds, uh, the 3D printers have like a certain tolerance on them. Uh, so these molds are not always perfect. Uh, with this thing here, like, let me take this out. You can see that this fits in pretty nicely, right? And this, this here kind of clicks in, so it, it all fits really great. But uh, we had to actually sand this down so that it would all fit in that nicely, right? Because uh, we also had to do it with this one as well, where the parts we were using didn't fit in perfectly. So, you know, that's something that you have to, I guess, uh, check before you actually start doing the process. Do your parts actually fit inside the uh, fixture that you are using? And the epoxy and sanding is also to make sure you have a smooth finish. When you are layering things on, everything is um, nice and smooth. Gotcha. Uh, uh, also, same as with like the other parts, you want to isopropyl alcohol it. It's for the same reason. You want to get rid of all the stuff that's on there. You just want to kill it all off so that it's not like a going to mess stuff up later. Um, okay, I guess when that's all done, you want to apply two to three layers of mold release. Mold release is like uh, you put like nonstick on a pan, right? You want to be able to like scrape the stuff off without it sticking to the pan. It's just I want to be able to take that catapult outside of the mold once it's done drying and not have to like wedge it off. So mold release allows us to do this. How you uh, basically apply it is you, you do one layer, you wait for it to dry after like five minutes or so, you do another layer and you just repeat that until you have the amount of layers that you want. Would you like to share your pancake example? Oh yeah, uh, <laughs> it's kind of like a pancake. If you uh, put pancake batter on a pan with not on stick, how many of you are like, I've tried to like scrape like a pancake or eggs off of like a pan and it doesn't come off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's not fun. And you have to clean that pan off later, which is really annoying. So just put mold release on your pans. It's not edible mold release. I mean, last time I tried, it didn't go so well. I think the analogy here is mold release is the same thing that butter does on a pan. It allows you to um, remove things cleanly and um, that is important when we're like, once everything's cured, if you put in all that work and if you're like making a nice pancake and then you try and flip it and it doesn't go anywhere, 
that's like a lost cause. So same thing with our carbon fiber. We want everything to stay together, be able to release cleanly. Okay, we talked about food. Glass beads, definitely not food. <laughs> okay. <laughs> These are also not the glass beads you see in jewelry. These are really, really tiny. These are less than a millimeter. Um, it's either uh, 0 0.4 millimeters or 0 0.04 millimeters, one of the two. Um, super tiny beads, um, they're kept in a spray bottle. If you like poof it, it gives you like a puff of glass beads. So they're very small and you want to mix them into the epoxy prior to applying to make sure the um, beads are covered in epoxy. Um, one thing on the safety side of this is this is an inhalation risk. You do not want glass in your lungs. If any of you are going to use glass beads, be really careful with precautions. Um, this means keeping your face as far away as, from the glass beads as possible, um, like making sure that you have masks on. Um, you aren't like taking a deep breath right near them. Um, they are quite small particles. And um, the reason for using these is to provide spacing and centering of the part and setting a bond gap. Um, imagine if you put everything in, there's all this glue in here, but there's a very tight fit. When you're epoxying things together, there's a tight fit between them. Um, this creates a, a, a gap of that diameter of that bead to make sure the epoxy has space to create a bond um, and actually bond between those two um, materials. Okay, all right. Uh, epoxy process. So we already talked about like preparation and everything that goes up to it. So we're gonna kind of just like go through that again. Uh, gather your components. Obviously you need all your stuff to put them together. So having all that you need ready, uh, that's good. Uh, set up your fixture. Uh, we talked about how you have to clean off the molds, make sure that everything gets in there nicely. Make sure that's all ready, have that there. Um, okay, surface prep. Uh, all your parts need to be cleaned off before the process starts unless you wanna do that while the epoxy is drying, which I'm guessing you probably don't. Um, uh, apply tape the surfaces. Uh, like Laura said before, we had bearings on this arm and you don't want epoxy in bearings or any like dust or stuff in there. So you wanna make sure that you tape those off uh, so that you know, it's protected from all this stuff. Um, okay, now you know, okay, apply the epoxy. Uh, you also wanna add the glass beads onto the epoxy while you're doing it. Uh, that can be kind of a tricky step, but we played around with it a bit yeah. and it's, yeah, so there's two ways of doing this. There's a way of getting directly from the epoxy gun onto your part and then sprinkling the glass beads over. The difficulty with this is making sure the glass beads are um, evenly coated with the epoxy since you want epoxy on both sides of it. It does not help us if you have like spaces that there's nothing touching the composite because there, then there's no bond if it's just glass to carbon fiber. So you want to make sure those are creating gaps but on both sides you have epoxy. So later in our process, we actually start uh, mixing the epoxy and glass beads prior. So you put them all in a bowl, add the glass beads, and then mix it. It's about a 2% ratio to the weight of the epoxy that you do in glass beads. We never got that ratio like right, because it's like it's kind of hard to determine exactly 2%, but so, so kind of just like yeah. guess so the glass maybe. beads, uh, you would need a, a scale that protects it from wind and everything to properly measure that but we put in a small amount that just like spreads throughout. Uh, okay, and then I guess finishing it off, you know, remove your tape before the epoxy dries. Epoxy is not easy to remove once it has dried. That's why we're using epoxy because it's very, very strong. Uh, and use paper towels at the end for like all excess epoxy. You put a ton of epoxy on the carbon fiber tube and a lot of it get, gets pushed out when you put your pieces on. So you wanna use a paper towel in order to kind of like wipe everything away and have like a, a kind of like a nice uh, finish on your tube. Yes, so we put tape on this section and that allows us to have a clean edge, but some of the times the epoxy will go further. So we just wipe that off and the rest will get removed with tape, allowing us to have like a clear cut line and like a bevel on that. So uh, one use of epoxy that, uh, or just adhesives in general, which is applicable to um, a lot of teams um, even if you aren't designing with like carbon fiber, is um, using adhesives to replace welding. Um, it improves your turnaround time. There's more uh, uh, flexibility with your assembly. So when you're assembling your drivetrain, you don't have to consider the time between like welding it and sending it out to welding and it coming back. And it el eliminates the possibility of like mess ups and welds. Say something 
fits in that space. Um, and then uh, we use it in combination with rivets. So there's epoxy that's laid down on our gussets and our bumper plates. So that in combination with like our rivets um, and or um, bolts created a strong um, bond with our like aluminum and our uh, drivetrain frame. Okay. Um, so when we want, when we're designing these 3D printing molds, you want to keep the whole process in mind. You want to ensure that all faces are like, I guess, kind of facing up. You don't want like to have like a sandwich of stuff and cause like that's harder to, I guess, remove and have everything get taken out. So you want to just like, like here, it's all kind of facing up and you can kind of just pop it out like yeah. that. So, so I just popped this out of the mold by lifting directly upwards. If there's any edges that went over it, this won't be able to move upwards. So you want to make sure that everything is facing upwards so your part doesn't get stuck in your mold. Um, uh, you also want to consider like how tools are going to be used to like get stuff out. So like we have kind of like gaps and stuff throughout like the design that like allows us to use different tools in order to get stuff up. I don't know if this actually counts, but we also have like uh, these zip tie holes here. So like that was taken into account. Like what would we what would we need in order to secure it to uh, the mold itself? Uh, so part number, another one um, that we have as a specific part is the Loctite Freecock 770NC. Um, this is the mold release we used on all of our layups. Um, this was also on our catapult as well as on these because we, like, kind of like the butter pancake analogy, we want to be able to take everything back out of the molds. Uh, also, when you're designing 3D printing molds, it's also like you can combine different like stuff. So like here we combined a pre-bought tube and also like creating our own design. So I guess kind of like consider like your options for creating a part when you're also creating the 3D printing mold. Just know that like, you know, there's more stuff that you can do. Yeah. Uh, also, the molds like 3D printers can only like, I guess, print such big stuff. So like if you're limited to a size of a 3D printer, uh, you can uh, actually have multiple 3D prints and connect them together in order to create something larger. Because that, that will work just as well. You can use uh, pins in order to kind of like yeah. secure them together. So for example, this one, it was a lot bigger than a 3D printed bed. So there's actually attachment points where these are attached. And the one thing to make sure is you want to smooth out those seams when you put those two together. But that allows you to have a bigger mold with um, the same size 3D printer. Okay, moving to vacuum bagging, that was the process used on this catapult, as well as we make our sponsor panels out of carbon fiber. Uh, so this is all a wet layup. It's a process that starts out with a carbon fiber cloth that you see up here. And it's layered either onto a mold like the, the 3D printed mold or it's layered onto a sheet. So for our sponsor panels, we just do a flat sheet of carbon fiber. Um, but for this one, that's a more unique shape. Or in 2015, there'd be a mold that you layer the cloth into. And you apply epoxy with each layer. So you're using a brush and applying epoxy in between layers. And depending on the amount of strength, so our sponsor panel, it's not under a lot of load. It just, it just, just, it stays there. Um, it doesn't have to hold anything. Just a couple stickers. That one, we just go with one layer. That's more than enough for a sponsor panel. Um, but for like um, a catapult, we'll use more layers because um, it needs to have that strength to it. Uh, we are, you'll place peel um, ply over the carbon fiber and then create a vacuum bag with a plastic sheet and air type tape. This is important because you want to completely airtight seal around your part. Uh, and then you're vacuum bagging this for 24 hours. The reason behind this is you're forcing the epoxy um, into the peel and ply, which reduces excess weight from epoxy adhesive. Um, and then following that time period, you're able to remove the bag and um, peel off the peel ply. So moving into so now we're going from our wet and layups as well as our like um, carbon fiber tubes into um, continuous fiber 3D printing. So Mark Forge prints, um, 3D prints, these we use because they can be weight bearing. We trust the materials on parts with load. For example, 2022 climber hooks, these things held 
almost 150 pounds, um, considering we were at max weight um, with our robot as well as the bumper and battery. Um, but this was something that was able to hold our robot and we were able to climb on consistently. Um, and it also can take the place of mill parts. Some um, traditional or like traditional like pieces that you need on the mill because they're unique shapes, you need multiple accesses, you're actually able to 3D print those. Um, you might need to use some material as like filler that you'll remove later. Um, but you can take load off your traditional um, manufacturing machines to allow that process to go cleaner because 3D printers can run even when students aren't there watching them, unlike lathes and uh, router and mill for us where we need supervision and we need lab time. A couple... A question, uh, for those folks, were that, was that Onyx with fiber or just Onyx? Uh, the question was, are those hooks Onyx with fiber or just Onyx? So our first iteration was, it was just Onyx. Um, that was actually due to a mistake in our Iger print. We printed the wrong version, but that held us through almost the majority of SFR. Uh, then we, we did switch out the parts with ones with carbon um, fiber inlay, and those were a lot stronger um, moving through the rest of our season. Uh, I will, the question was about infill on the hooks. I will go into infill a little bit later. All right, so a couple other things we 3D printed were the pulleys. So this pulley right here that um, operates our roll joint as well as some other ones on our robot are 3D printed. This allowed us to have unique sizes for the exact um, um, inner diameter, like the outer diameter of the tube be the inner diameter of our pulley and make sure those fit together. We also designed ridges for epoxy. Um, Actually, in that case, um, I think, yeah. So we designed those and then we were able to add like stops to it as well. This allows you to have unique pulleys for your use case. Another thing is spacers. This went from all the way from really thin spacers that are super hard to lay because you need to hold tight tolerances and um, it just gets finicky going right up against the truck on those. So 3D printing those was something we used a lot. Like on these, on the climbers, there's bearings there. To offset those bearings, we have 3D, thin 3D printed spacers, which need to be um, pretty high tolerance. But then you also have this thing, which we also call a spacer. <laughs> this was holding our Versa Planetary and, uh, together and it created space between the two belts. So um, you can have like larger scale parts that um, create space, as well as your camera mounts like these. Um, those were all our electrical components are often um, held in um, like a, a 3D printed box so they are protected um, in that. Okay, uh, there are different like fiber inlays that you can use when 3D printing. Uh, as Lara said before, there's carbon fiber which we used for those hooks in 2022. So sometimes we do use the carbon fiber and that, you know, that greatly increases the strength and the, stick, the stiffness of the part as opposed to just using the onyx material itself. Um, there's also glass fiber. We don't use the glass fiber inlay at all, I'm pretty sure. We've used it on a few parts in our robots, but it's not one of our most common ones. Uh, we have uh, three different 3D printers, um, and we have one that's capable of glass inlay. Majority of our parts we just print with onyx, but sometimes we optimize using these. Uh, glass fiber can be good because it's like it's more affordable compared to like carbon fiber or Kevlar. Uh, it's just you know, as like we said, we don't use it as much as the other ones. Uh, there's also Kevlar, which is very very strong. Uh, we've used it a couple times over the past as well, uh, and you know it's great for if you have something that needs to be like super super strong. Uh, and then you know you want to 3D print it as opposed to like using like an aluminum part or whatever. And like Kevlar is the same as like what you often see in like bulletproof vests. Um, this material um, is often used for like whenever it's under impact. So like anything outside the frame perimeter is where you often see us using like Kevlar. And then uh, I guess the reason that there's like we we try to use different inlays is because. Like similarly with like the carbon fiber ply types, there's always like different scenarios in which you need different like requirements of like sniff to, stiffness and strength and I guess kind of flexibility a bit. Uh, so just like, I guess it says that like, do not assume that one kind of thing is gonna fit all of your needs. Think about like what different materials would be best for different scenarios. And yeah, 
Um, moving into more specifics on 3D printing fiber layout. So fiber fill type can literally make or break um, your part. As I mentioned with the climber hooks, those climber hooks did hold up, but after um, a hit to them, they, they, weren't able, they, were, they didn't make it through a full competition with just Onyx. And that was actually not even because of the carbon fiber inlay, but because of our pathing um, on um, like your fill type. So isotropic fill is your default, but it's often the wrong ch um, choice for common use cases. Uh, we use concentric fill for the climber hooks on the ones that held up through a season. Those ones actually took a hit. We climbed, we're on one hook. Our, like there was a weird, there was another robot that hit us when we were in the, the climbing. So only one hook catches on. The other robot's still trying to get out. It still hits us while we are hanging on one hook. That hook takes a twist, it still stands even with that impact. Um, we've also had one of these hooks, um, like we were driving and the climber released and the climber was actually pushing up the entire climbing structure. Um, we were off by about like a couple inches. The climber is on the bar and it's just pushing directly up. And it, it's, since it's automatic, it just keeps, it's like going up against the structure. Um, so it withstood that. Um, we were like, we came back to pit crew and we're like, oh no. We saw that match, we came back, we looked at everything everything was still perfectly fine. There was no bending, there was no skipping, everything um, like withstood those forces. So for us, the concentric fill of those climber hooks uh, worked really well. This is an image from Iger, which is what we use for our um, 3D printed parts, and it resists um, x-axis bending. So talking more about isotropic fill, that's a zigzag pattern that simulates the layer orientations from a laminated composite and it resists bending in the X and Y axis, which is helpful in some use cases, um, but with like, and then there's also the opposite of that, this is the other um, fiber layer is concentric fill. This is fiber laid around the perimeter of the wall, and um, it usually bends in the X, resists bending in the X axis. Um, longer parts, skinnier parts that are thinner, that's where you wanna be using your concentric fill. I'm gonna open this up to questions. Thank you all for listening. Um, any questions that you have regarding this, um, topics that are related that you'd like us to like, refer more on, um, I can pass around both the molds and the catapult itself if you'd like to feel. I will tell you one thing about the catapult is I lifted this before it had double sticky tape and afterwards, and I will say this tape made it a whole lot heavier. So. <laughs> Um, the carbon fiber is quite light. Um, we can start from this side and pass it around. Here you go, Leo. Do we have any questions? Um, if a team were like start using carbon fiber, like what do you think the cost would be to, like everything going? So carbon fiber, um, you using the tubes is relatively um, easier to get started with. Um, that is just you would need the tubes themselves and then epoxy to hold it together. We, rec we recommend using a, like an a adhesive or clamping just so you're not drilling through to add a bolt through your part. Um, that would be my recommendation there. Um, layups you would need um, to also build like larger molds and things like that. Um, yeah. I don't have the exact number for you. I can check our purchasing list, get back to you individually on that. But uh, yeah, we do apply for sponsorships and benevity and grants to support us in these like more innovative projects. Shall I grab our spare arm? Sure. I I mean, hey, I'll get it. I'll get you it. you I'll get, get it? it. I'll okay. Get it. Yeah. Mac is gonna go get our spare arm. I can continue talking through questions. Uh, I'll, Anything I'll you have yeah. about like the mechanics on the robot? If you want to talk about our 2023 or 2022 robot, I can go ahead and ask or answer any mechanical questions. So, so 2023, okay. yes. Do you mean like your fabrication team or does it mean like your design team that's like focusing on how like putting together the carbon fiber? So the question is um, whether it is our fabrication team or our design team working on putting together our carbon fiber. Um, actually, we don't have a design and a fabrication team on 971. Um, we take a slightly different approach we do everything in a subsystem itself. So when I say I was a subsystem lean for arm links, I was in charge of getting this from the Crayola CAD geometry all the way to a physical arm. Um, and that means that you're going through with the, the CAD. <laughs> I don't know where to put this. Gotcha. 
Um, that means you're going through all the way with the CAD um, to the actual okay. assembly, and there's a group of students on this. So we can show the different ways it moves. Here, have a, okay, okay. Have a proximal. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this arm right here, uh, it's divided into sections, but um, for fabrication, it was a group of students um, who were interested. You have your lead student who follows the same design through it, but anyone who's interested can join the fabrication. Like we had some new students who joined us, um, Daniel in the back, he was helping on um, the assembly of these carbon fiber arms. We had electrical students who were there as part of it. Um, it was a wide variety of people. We gave different people experience in it. Yeah. Uh, also, you could see how like different parts of the arm line up with these fixtures. So like you have this like kind of piece here. Oh yeah, it's kind of yeah, awkward. It's kind of awkward. Uh, yeah. You can see like this, this piece here, and you can see kind of how can it I like... Can I shoot one of you? <laughs> <laughs> can you grab the fixture? Not that one, the other one. <laughs> yeah. okay, thank okay, thank okay. you, Leo, thank you. Uh, right. It's like so. this kind of like fits into here, right? And then <laughs> there's these two parts here, and we had these uh, little things on rails uh, that we would uh, screw into these parts here so that we knew that they would all be... Uh, here. I got, I got it. Okay, you got it? Okay, okay. Uh, so that it would all kind of be in the same direction. <laughs> we should put this on the ground. Yeah. yeah. Okay. How strong is like the clamping when you do like when you have like attachments to the intake? So this is held by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen volts. A lot of bolts. Um, that was able to keep it clamped. Um, we actually decided not to use um, an ad adhesive there because this intake is hot swappable. We're able to take it off and swap, swap in a different intake. Um, oh, I didn't repeat the question. Hey, audience. <laughs> the question I just answered was, um, how is the clamping force on the end effector um, in like, relation to like, using adhesive? And that's held using bolts because we want it to be changeable throughout the season. Yes. How long does it take to like, switch? We have switched arms on the robot in 12 minutes before. So, oh my goodness. <laughs> take two. So the question was, how long does it take to switch the arms on the robots? Uh, we have done a swap between the arms in 12 minutes. Um, that is in like the mechanical, um, taking off the arm, putting the arm back on, getting the chains in line and getting everything hooked up in electrical. Reason being is there are six bolts that hold this entire arm in. You undo six bolts um, on the inside of this, you can lift the entire arm off the robot after you take the chains off. So we designed this for serviceability. If something does go wrong in this arm, this is our spare arm, we can take off the arm from our comp bot, put the spare arm off on, and then fix our other arm during breaks and matches. Yes? Did you ever change an arm in competition? The question was, did we ever change an arm in competition? I was actually not on pit crew, even though I led the subsystem, so I have, I'm not actually sure. Matt, do you know? I wasn't on pit crew. You weren't on pit crew either. Do we have any pit crew members? Nope. SSR. We switched at Monterey? Okay. <laughs> we did do a swap of the arm. Thank you for feedback from the audience. Um, and we were able to switch to our spare arm and continue with competition. We also just swapped this arm like a week ago, because... Yeah. Uh, this one had a bearing break on the inside somehow. So that's pretty so, cool. Yeah. Yes. How many people does it take to do like the swap? Three, probably. Yeah. Um, we got three students. We were able to do it. We want to have someone holding the bolt, someone holding the arm, making sure that everything stays put. The question was that um, was how many people does it take to switch the arm? And the answer to that was about three people. Um, but you do also want to make sure that you keep electrical informed and you have a software person. So I'd say three people mechanically to take it off, but make sure that you have other people involved. Those people who are taking it off mechanically could also be electrical, but the idea is just three people to take it off physically, but you also want to pull in expertise for electrical and software. Yes? Can you print with carbon fiber without like a more sports printer? Maybe. I quite repeat the question. I don't think so. Hey, oh, okay. The question was, can you print carbon fiber without a Mark Forge printer? 
That is an Evan question, because he is our 3D printing lead. Do you want to come up? Sure. <laughs> this is Evan. Here you go, Evan. I'm going to give you my microphone. All right. Oh, shoot. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so the answer to that question is Ooh. any or many printers can print in carbon fiber, but um, to print continuous fiber, you pretty much, there's some other brands other than Mark, Mark Forged that you can print in continuous fiber, but uh, Mark Forged is the industry standard for, for that. Um, and the print quality is really high and they're really, really strong parts. Thank you, Evan. I didn't invest this in your presentation, but how do you deal with like, the safety hazards of carbon fiber? The question was, how do you deal with the safety effects of carbon fiber? Uh, this is through proper ventilation again, and making sure everyone's informed of what materials you're using with and what uh, you need to be careful of. And this needs to be done before you start sanding or using any of these uh, potentially um, dangerous materials. Yes. Um, you mentioned there's sometimes not great times to use carbon fiber. Can you give us some examples of that? Okay, well, so I guess we're making a third robot right now, right? And we have these blocks that secure like a gearbox down. And that would not be a good time to use carbon fiber because you want something that's a lot more like rigid and kind of like solid aluminum there would work best rather than having like carbon fibers, I guess it's kind of good for this if you want. Also, also carbon fibers, like it's a lot harder to, I guess, implement into your design. Like this, this took probably a couple hours per arm to do the layout stuff while making like, I don't know, if you wanted to use aluminum for something, it would, it would be significantly less time and it's also a lot less complicated. So I guess sometimes, yeah. I guess sometimes aluminum, oh, I wasn't really, oh, the question, the question <laughs> was, would it be better sometimes to use, not use carbon fiber, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Adding on to that answer, uh, with um, use of carbon fiber or not using carbon fiber is it does take a lot like as we're talking about safety concerns if you want something you can drill through that's the application you don't want to be using carbon fiber um, also um, for stuff lower down we want to keep our weight lower so everything um, like this tube right here we use alumin um, aluminum for um, the cross member tube is aluminum uh, carbon fiber is more for those um, larger mechanisms as you need to keep light and stiff um, and like I talked about in our 2022 robot we use plywood on our robot. Um, that's another composite. It is light. It was able to hold up to the stress we were putting it under. Um, and that was a perfectly valid use of a material. Um, we've also used field lexan. So we go all the way from expensive carbon fiber to actually like stuff that used to be on the field. Um, let's see. Um, 2022, I believe there's like some field lexan on here. Um, and then it's just like, you can reuse um, like material. It doesn't have to always be the most expensive to do the job. Are we ready for a quiz? Starting off with question one. Can someone tell me what a composite is? So uh, the analogy was like two things like handshaking. Yeah, like this. All right. Yeah, woo, got it right. Who can tell us if breathing in carbon fiber dust is okay or not? Breathing in carbon fiber dust is not okay. Okay, are you ready for this one? What is the name of the 60 minute epoxy that we use? Uh, 3M DP460NS. I'm very proud of you. Yes. Very nice, nicely done. Okay, so uh, why do we prep before epoxying materials? So we only have one time to get it right. The answer was Good answer. Uh, you only have one time to get it right. And then um, in addition to that is so we don't waste time during the epoxy process. Can someone tell me why we use mold release? Ooh, a lot of hands. You. <laughs> so you don't get parts stuck. Yes, exactly. So it's easy to remove from the mold. Thank you, everyone. Uh, if you, can, you have a question? Mac, is trail mix a composite? Repeat the question. <laughs> the oh. question was, is trail mix a composite? Trail mix is not a composite. It is just a mixture of a bunch of different stuff, but they're not, they're not together and they're not creating yeah. something much stronger. If you were able to take like trail mix like, and like weave it together. Think of a granola bar. Granola bar is a composite. 
<laughs> cake, cake is like a alloy. Cake is an alloy. Everything mixes together. <laughs> what about a cookie? A cookie is an um, a cookie is like a cookie is like an alloy and a composite. <laughs> it's like the alloy point is the cookie part, but the chocolate chips. If you're doing chocolate chips, that would be a composite. Grab the stickers.